when we don't realize we're going into the metaverse and exiting the metaverse, when it happens without effort, that's when it takes off. I think we're close, but we have to figure out how to design it so it's seamless. Welcome back, everybody, to Barriers to Entry. We are the podcast that every episode gets into it with the leaders, designers, and early adopters and influencers who are helping shape Web3, the metaverse, and blockchain specifically for the architecture and design industry. I'm Andrew Lane, and with me, as always, are my lovely co-hosts from the Sandow Design Group, Bobby Benet. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Lovely. And the esteemed esteemed, <laughs> esteemed co-founder at Digby, Tessa Bain. Welcome, guys. So little known fact, Barriers to Entry is not a basketball podcast, but I did want to check the NBA standings in recognition of today's guest, who is the president of the New York Knicks fan club. And there's really not much that this guy hasn't been the president of. And he's even got a personal connection to one of our co-hosts. It is personal for me. I actually had the opportunity and the pleasure of getting to work with the one and the only John Edelman. The cat's out of the bag. The cat is out of the bag. And, you know, it's a really interesting story. I wanted to work at Design Within Reach. We are based out of Toronto, Canada. And Design Within Reach contract had not yet come to Canada. And so I, thinking this to myself, thought, you know, I am perfect for that job. I am passionate about Design Authentic Furniture. They are the leaders in Design Authentic Furniture in North America. And so I flew down to Chicago. It's Neocon. And I developed a business pitch and I was convinced. I knew what I was going to do. I walked in. I was so motivated. I sat down with John and John McPhee at the time and I pitched them on why I should represent Design Within Reach contract in Canada. And so that was really the story of one of my early interactions with John. If anyone's met John, he's an incredible businessman. And so the conversation was, of course, intimidating. I left there feeling confident, but I wasn't 100% sure. The next morning, I walk downstairs. I'm waiting on the Uber to go into the Mart. And I see John, and he looks at me, and he says, are you happy? And I was like, well, happy about what? And he's like, about your job that you got. And I was like, this is amazing. It was the most epic way to get told that you've got a job. And then John got into his black car, and I got into my Toyota Camry. <laughs> it's hard yeah. to not get a Toyota Camry sometimes, too, when you call an Uber, so you can't be faulted for that. No, like they're, they're kind of everywhere. Toyota, not an official podcast sponsor yet, <laughs> yeah. but uh, shout out to the reliability on that car. One of the great things about John is that he is a consummate innovator. He's always looking for the way to push the boundary and to see what's next and to embrace what's next. And we actually had the opportunity to be on a CEU panel together at Neocon last year. You know, that really got the conversation going with him uh, about where his head was at with all these new spaces. And so it's going to be really exciting just to hear uh, from someone in a position like him about how his company and how uh, he's thinking as a businessman about the opportunities that this space is going to be able to provide. All right. So let's get into it with John. Courtside with us today is the current CEO of Heller, executive chairman of Krypton, and a board member of Chilowich, B Original Americas, and Diffa. When he's not turning around businesses, he's at the Garden, trying to relive the glory days of 1973. <laughs> Thrilled to have him here today. Welcome, John Edelman. Welcome, John. Welcome, John. So glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You know, we'll get to metaverse and design in a moment, but I think the first question we have to ask is if you're hoping the Knicks tank for Victor Wambanyama this year. Now listen, we don't tank for anybody. We are the New York Knicks. We do our best every single time. And if all of our starters get injured and we get last place, I'll take the recruit. But for right now, maybe we'll trade our picks, but we're going to do our best to win this year. Like we do every year. And like I like said- Like you do every year in the preseason. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a preseason guy. I watched both preseason games from beginning to end. And we did very well. So we got two more preseason games then we get to go to opening night. So I'm ready. At least there's some good consolation prizes this year. So <laughs> lots to Only look forward you're the to. Worst. <laughs> <laughs> John, we're going to be all over the map today, but let's start with NFT and IP ownership. Most importantly, why are you so passionate about authentic design? You know, I spent my entire professional career defending authentic design. I come from the leather business where no one knows about leather. It's all your word and what's true, what's not. And then I went into design within reach and the biggest issues they had were from copying other people's design. So immediately I was put on the defensive and flushed all those copies away. 
I joined Be Original Americans as a board member. I'm a permanent ambassador. I was the president. And we fight for authenticity to fund the future of design. Imagine how difficult it is to come up with a great design. In order to come up with a great design, you need to fail. And failing is expensive. So if you do a great design and someone copies it, you don't profit from it. You can't produce the next great design. So it's a horrible kind of pattern that happens when people start to copy. We need to defend authenticity so that we can support the next great iconic designs. And so in your recent position at Heller, how are you protecting or championing authentic design? Yeah, so I'm fighting anybody that knocks us off with obviously with aggressive deceit and desist notes. I think our reputation precedes us and I'm trying to teach our designers how to protect their original designs. Andrew and Tess, how does that work when it comes to protecting original design through an NFT or through a digital token? One of the biggest things about it and what a lot of people don't recognize about NFT is the idea of NFT is that it's a one of one and it's very much similar to an authentically designed product in that way. And as John just so eloquently put, the importance of that one of one design is something that needs to be protected. And the blockchain actually offers an opportunity to do that in a, an indisputable way, in a way that shows us with a token that this is a one of one design, that this was originally manufactured on behalf of the true designer and sold to a particular individual. And all of that stuff can be traced and become a permanent record that really creates all kinds of other opportunities for the product in terms of second life and sustainability. To unpack that a little bit, when Andrew mentioned second life and third life, so we design great products, a manufacturer like Heller creates great products. Throughout the lifetime of those products, we can track now users using blockchain technology. We can track end of product life cycle. Heller has a fantastic sustainability story of recycling those units. And so now we can have an accurate forecast and path of where that product is going all the way up into the end of its life cycle. Andrew and Tess are working with John on some exciting things tied to NFTs and authentic design in the metaverse. John, when you talk with designers and mention these efforts, how do they typically respond or react? Are they thinking about things the same way you are as it relates to authenticity? Yeah, they really are. Designers, that's all they have to stand on is their name and their designs. So it's the bane of a designer's existence to work so hard to have it be copied. The olden days, you you take a picture of your design or you'd actually take the original design, copy it, throw it in a FedEx, mail it to yourself and not open it. And that was called a poor man's patent. We can move above that and go digital and have a real non-fungible guarantee. Like you can't argue with it. It's done. It's forever. I think that's a great solution. And they're fighting for solutions. They're searching for solutions. And this is a great solution to give them. So John, the rules of physics don't apply in the metaverse. And while that's appealing to some, others are excited by the challenge of problem solving within set limitations. Is the lack of earth-based physics advantageous or does it work against design processes in your opinion? Listen, I think it's all about the individual designer. I think some designers love it and design these fantasy worlds that couldn't be created on earth. And maybe some of that falls back to earth and influences our design today. I did broach it with Frank Gehry and I suggested he designed a city in the metaverse. And I was so excited. And I said, imagine you have no limitations. All your wildest dreams could be pursued. And he said to me, the rules are why I live. My whole design is yeah. based on living with existing rules and then creating new boundaries, but within the physical realm. So I think it's different for everybody. My son, when he grows up, they're not going to care about the rules. They're not going to have them. They're going to either design it themselves or live in it virtually, but that's going to be different for everybody. What do you think that tipping point looks and feels like? You're talking to designers all the time. When we look at these principles and the fact that an established and renowned professional like Frank Gehry has that point of view on it. But I'm sure that to your point, there's the very opportunistic end of the spectrum and there's a lot of people in the middle. What kinds of things are you hearing in your conversations that you're having? Yeah, I'm hearing that they're excited. It's almost like therapy for some of them to design in the metaverse mm -hmm. because they can kind of execute their dreams and they love it. I think you remember Frank Gehry's 92 years old. It's very hard to change a direction you've been going in, and he's a genius. But in the younger generation, it's not a question of, are the boundaries important? It really is a question of, do the boundaries matter at all because you are designing in a new world? So if you bring pre-existing boundaries into a new civilization, you'll be left behind, and you're going to have to change your mindset. Steve Jobs did that by taking mushrooms or whatever and expanding his <laughs> mind that way. But it's almost that same kind of philosophy of mind expansion, which is going to have to happen 
to really take full advantage of the metaverse. I love that idea of the philosophy of mind expansion. And the other thing that we think is really interesting and curious if you've been exploring it is this idea that outside of design itself, there's ways that we can solve problems and test out thoughts and just experiment in some of these 3D digital environments that can be used for design. Yeah, first was 3D printing, right? Which is almost like bringing the metaverse to us, bringing something from nothing to reality. Now, this week, I worked with a great young group called Jumbo Studios out of New York, and they used CNC cutting to cut layers of foam to put on top of each other to create the shape of a chair to create my sit to see if it was comfortable. So imagine if they could have done that virtually and my perfectly formed avatar sat in it to see if it was mm -hmm. comfortable. And that's not that far away. They're, they're totally connected, but it would have saved months of development. And I think exploring those shapes, exploring those fits and developing a way to see if things work virtually, not only is it saves time, it's good for the environment, there's less waste and probably end up with a more perfect finished product. I think we need to get a look at that avatar, John, to get a sense of, <laughs> of what virtual John looks like. <laughs> I don't, I think it'll be scary. It has to be just, the only way for it to work is it has to look exactly like me right? Right. in every way. Like it has to be like, I guess I'd get scanned or something, but that's a scary thought. You know, quality and craftsmanship are what set luxury and premium goods apart from everyday products. Are you feeling like luxury brands are getting it right in the metaverse today? I think they can afford to execute their vision in the metaverse, right? So you think about a luxury brand, so much of their money is put into marketing, whether it's in Louis Vuitton or Hermes, and I think they are getting it right. I'm not an expert in that, but I can see that they're investing in their image for the future. They're going to open up their virtual stores on the virtual Fifth Avenue. And they have the dollars to invest and they're getting press from it. It's building. I think they're actually the leaders in that world, as far as I can see. You guys feel the same way? I would agree there. Yeah, I would say so. Do you think that virtual John needs some virtual Hermes, I guess is <laughs> where we go <laughs> from here. It's a, good, it's a good question. I'm not flash. So I think I'm going to go like virtual J. Crew, but just have it fit real well. Let's see how it goes. I don't need virtual luxury or even real luxury. I think, I think it's all going to depend. I think that it's fun to go in initially and create the flash and create the glitter and glam to get people interested. But then your own lifestyle, unless you're going to be somebody different, I think it's going to be who you are, maybe just with a little more freedom. If I'm not wearing Hermes and Vuitton now, I'm not going to do it in the virtual world. I don't think. That's just me. I think that's exactly right. In Web 2, on social media, we're putting out an image of ourselves that we aspire to be. And I spent more time than I'm willing to admit fine tuning my Bitmoji on Snapchat the other day. <laughs> and you see the brands on there and I'm looking at the clothing options. I'm like, I'm a guy who wears like Nike. I'm going to choose the Nike outfit all, all over the default Snapchat outfit. And at some point, I'm sure the question will arise, will I pay a dollar or a fraction of a digital token in order to access that premium good so that I'm continuing to push forward that vision, that image of myself that I want to. Well, John's yeah, a watch yeah. collector, right? Like you're, you collect exactly. watches in the physical world. How does that collector mindset transfer in the way that Bobby's talking about, in the way that we're thinking about what our virtual avatars need? Does our collection just grow into the digital space? I don't know. I think what I really want to do <laughs> is take my collection and develop non-fungible tokens that represent what I've already done and mm -hmm. take it forward because it's so personal. And if it's not super hard to find, so if you can just buy it, I'd never be interested in it anyway. I don't know how to go out there and search for things yet in the metaverse. How do you find a 1970s watch when the 1970s, this stuff wasn't invented? So I think collecting so, for me is almost a bit of going into the past versus the metaverse to me is looking towards the future. I love your metaverse collectible search engine. It's a good time to remind you that all the business ideas generated on the podcast are property <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> but yeah, like that's an incredibly interesting point is that we haven't yet seen interoperability. How do these metaverses function together? How do you get centralized within that and say, hey, I really want to find the rare stuff. I don't want to find the stuff that Snapchat Bobby's wearing. No offense there, Snapchat Bobby. But how do I find the ultra rare? How do I really authenticate things that are meaningful to me because of the fact that they're unique? I think it's ultimately going to be how and where we ascribe value as members of the metaverse. What might be ultra rare or have the feeling of ultra rarity in a metaverse is going to be a lot different than the physical world. 
I can imagine if I'm walking around in a metaverse and I see something from Hermes lying on the ground, my initial reaction might be, oh, this is probably something that's common. I don't need to pick this up. I'm going to leave it here and breaking down that boundary a little bit in terms of where is their value to be had is a problem to be solved ultimately. And, and we'll change what is exciting and valuable and limited edition in the metaverse versus the physical world. We had a really interesting conversation with a product designer. And during the pandemic, he was using his Oculus and watching Netflix with one of his family members. And so they're sitting in this Oculus living room. And in the living room, he's like, I'm looking around. Here I am, a product designer. And everything is like garbage in terms of furniture and in terms of design. And so he's sitting on this idea saying, there's a real opportunity to represent myself and my interests in my space. And that extends itself over to furniture. When you walk into someone's home, I talk about collectibles, you know, they might have invested in those pieces of furniture and for that community that says something. I wonder if that has a bit of an opportunity. Sure it does. That's to emulate someone else's lifestyle. I get that. That's super cool. But that's almost to an influencer stage. But how do you find a four coaster Eames chair that was produced before OSHA made him put five coasters, casters, excuse me. I think that's a different way of collecting. And Mm -hmm. I think I see the metaverse as a way to authenticate your existing and then hopefully take it with you because I don't want to leave home with all my favorite stuff. And I don't need to go to the metaverse to get new stuff. How can I want to hang out there with new people and bring my old stuff? Yeah. And what I think you're talking about a little bit is the wallet, which exists right now. And so you have Instagram, for example, allowing users to post NFTs that they hold in their wallet and sort of share those in a very social setting. And so that might be, you know, a further iteration of kind of that concept. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's interesting even to see the way that our friends at places like Christie's and Sotheby's have embraced the space and the kinds of things that they're thinking about that in respect as well. So the roadmap is definitely there. And I think what's so interesting is all these companies, Christie's, Sotheby's, they have no choice but to embrace it. It doesn't mean they know what they're doing. They're just, they're getting their feet wet so they can say they're doing it. You're not supposed to let the secret out that nobody really knows (laughs) uh, what they're doing. (laughs) Yeah, but that's the exciting part is that Mm -hmm. it's unfolding as we watch. You you talk about an amalgamator to hunt in the meta world. Who thought we'd get a smart TV and have all your apps in one place so you can watch Hulu, Netflix, Apple, whatever it's going to be on the screen that wasn't possible. That part, some of it has to catch up. We don't know exactly how we're gonna access things in the metaverse and from what different verses. I wanna live next to Snoop Dogg, what's not possible? Let me all create a new Snoop Dogg house and be on his new block or something. I don't know how that's gonna fall out, but I can't live next to him in Malibu either. You know, we'll see what happens. I I wanna harken back to one kind of the anecdote tests you were sharing about the interaction you were having with the product designer and I'd wonder John, how you would approach the question about you have limited edition or limited availability and you have luxury and you have beauty. But when you think about furniture in a metaverse, are we still going to be talking about utility or will that lead to a different way in which product designers are thinking about how they're developing office products? I have a far out view on this. And I think it depends how immersive your metaverse experience becomes. So are you actually going to sit in that virtual furniture? And we have a way to feel how it feels, right? Until you can feel it, it doesn't matter. It's purely visual. It doesn't matter what the design is. If it's not hitting your lumbar or whatever it's going to be. But as the technology progresses and we immerse ourselves and actually feel our surroundings, then it has to change. So why bother making a comfortable chair now in the metaverse? It doesn't really matter. You do it for this overall look. I'm sure 80% is going to be inspired by Saren because people believe that's what the future is going to look like still. I don't know. I think comfort happens when you need comfort. We are creatures that perform to how we're incentivized. If you're incentivized through comfort, then you design comfort. If you're incentivized through beauty, you design beauty. If you get lucky enough to do both, you do both. But you know what's actually needed at the moment, it's much more visual. It's interesting when you talk about those incentives, because you could make a, a number of arguments, but just for the sake of the conversation, I'll make the argument that the metaverse is incentivized by interaction, by being social. What kinds of designs and what kinds of spaces and structures and shapes and details are we going to need to incentivize that kind of interaction? Right now, I think a lot of it is feigning beauty and comfort because we're familiar with it from the physical world so that people will feel at ease when they step into these spaces. We know what a chair is, but what's a non-chair when I actually don't need to sit because my legs never get tired? What kinds of creative uh, inspirations are going to come from really starting to understand the way that people use 
these new spaces. And I, I think, Bobby, you were starting to get there. Future of work is probably going to be one of the leading areas in how this comes to be, because it's one of those instances where our interactions are a little bit more like forced, let's call it, because we're getting together with a group of people on a regular basis to try and create outcomes. How is all this going to come together in your mind, John? I love the idea that we can go to a virtual conference room and it can be in the 175th floor of a New York City building that hasn't been built yet. And we're looking at the view of everything beautiful in the city. But how am I going to pay attention to the meeting? It's distracting. Or do I want to be in like an immersive color that inspires me to be calm and listen and pay attention? I don't know. I mean, that's what's so exciting. That's what I keep going back to is it's all brand new. Am I sitting in the same room with somebody and the same planet with somebody? What's required to create the best level of communication, which means listening and projecting. So I don't know what it is yet. I know that people aren't going back to the office five days a week, whatever the hours are for a really long time. I don't care what people say. I think it's all changed. So how do you create a feeling of connectivity in a virtual world that creates a vibe of collaboration and learning and mentoring? That's what it, it has to improve. It, it's got to improve it, right? There's no question it wasn't perfect pre-pandemic. So now you add a bunch of different factors. You're at home, you're separated. You might be suburban versus being urban. How do you maximize the interaction to benefit everybody? And it brings you know? up a really good point. And we talk a lot about inclusiveness of people that are physically in the office and then people that are joining in virtually. And how do you make that communication really seamless? I have no answers, but how do you design a beautiful space? And what does that research look like? And that's why we always defer to the experts, the designers. What does that look like? Everybody's favorite spot in the office today is the phone booth. Mm -hmm. It's completely unadorned. There's no distraction and no one hears you outside the room. So why does everybody like that so much? They choose that over a conference room. I think that's really interesting. It's a focused space. How do you mm -hmm. elevate that? How do you encourage the connectivity? I was in California at a huge office. Currently, they have more phone booths than people coming to the office. They have mm -hmm. um, a building that holds 500. They have 150 phone booths and 50 people are coming to work. <laughs> and even in the empty office, they choose to work out of a phone booth sometimes. I like, think that focus well, space is something that people have missed for the last two years, though, working with kids and families and other distractions around the house. So you give up the need to commute, but you also lose the ability to isolate and to focus in a way that'll allow you to potentially be productive in the way that you feel like it. There's something scary to... about that too, though. I mean, we're talking about designing an office that has the right tint of blue that will lead you to feel calmer. But I'd be a little worried about an over-engineered metaverse that is set up in such a way that we're reducing any sort of I don't know variation in your day that might lead to a different type of creativity. And that's what like. That's why I use the phone booth when it's available more than I should, but it's also kind of a crummy place to work in some instances, if you're supposed to be coming to an office to interact with other people and have these chance encounters and have these moments where they were unplanned or they weren't overly engineered. And John, I think you feel passionate about the idea of enhancing and enabling creativity as a table stakes feature for somebody to want to go to a metaverse three days a week, not just once every three months. I always went to Steve Jobs, but he used to have, like, have meetings where they went on walks. How do I go on a walk with you and be in different places? And is it a real walk or is it a virtual walk? Are we seeing the same thing or different things? So in the metaverse, we can probably go on a walk and get inspired or see the same things at the same time that'll inspire our creativity, inspire our learning, inspire our conversation. And that's pretty cool. Zoom doesn't do that. Right. Zoom is a short term one on one thing. So is the phone booth. But how do you create a young person in Singapore working with a young person in Austin, Texas, and have them feel that they're in the same environment, sharing the same effects? We're just at the very beginning, right? Everybody agrees with that. How's it going to fall out and how are you going to feel it? I think that one of the interesting factors in this, your walk example is a good one. We still have this confinement to the rigidity of a five day a week, 40 hour work week. What we're talking about and a lot of the ideas you're sharing is something that's a lot more fluid, where it's about the utility of spaces, the ability to find optimal work environments. What's the design opportunity there to really start to think, and is it possible that good design could be the way for us to reimagine truly the way that we interact with our work selves as people? 
Quick interruption to this episode because I want to tell you all about another podcast that I think you'll enjoy. It's called Looking Forward, and it's from our good friend Ryan Anderson, who is the VP of Global Research and Insights at Miller Knoll. The show is all about the future of the workplace, particularly in the A&D industry, which you know is a topic we love here at Barriers to Entry. You got to check out Looking Forward if you're like us and want to push the conversation around what exactly works at work. The show is part of the Surround Podcast Network, just like Barriers to Entry. So go take a listen at surroundpodcasts.com or follow Looking Forward wherever you get your podcasts. Good design will be the way. It's the only way, right? And it's today's Theranins, Eames, and all the classic designers that they have a vision of the future, things that last forever. Modern design is what I call it, but it could be a different term than modern going forward. But our spaces will be designed. If they're not designed, there'll be chaos, right? People won't ever connect. How do people like to interact? What is the best scenario? What makes them feel the most connected in a completely disconnected environment? And that's not an easy question to solve. I mean, that people developed the open office plan and everybody did the open office. Employees hated it. They had to fix it. They bought the phone booths and this and that. It's a hundred percent about design. The question is which design and how people are going to go about it, but it is, it's purely design. That's a serious responsibility for designers too. Starting to think about metaverses and virtual worlds when they're used to thinking about physical products or physical spaces. Exactly. How do you expand your mind to get there? Because it's not something you're familiar with. And maybe our generation won't be able to do it. It may have to fall to the next one. It knows nothing different. If the generation that doesn't know anything but wearing an Apple Watch, having a device attached to your body, that changes a lot of things. We started having the phone never leaving our body, but they actually wear an Apple device or a sleep measuring device or an exercise mm-hmm. device. It's that interaction with technology that's going to allow for that kind of Herculean jump forward in the metaverse. Because it's not going to happen if you're not physically engaged at some point to go to the next level. It's interesting because that generation that you're talking about, like they're not far out from being a part of the workforce, being the people who potentially join design firms and architecture firms and and become these designers that you're talking about as the CEO of a company and talking to a lot of other leaders. Is that a conversation that's happening? How do you attract and make a place for this next generation of talent? Yeah, I'm just a small fish in this world at the moment. My little baby company, Heller, it's tiny. So I'm just trying to get people outside. (laughs) <laughs> I'm the opposite. <laughs> with, with Heller Furniture, my concept is let's take the meeting outside and walk outside and sit outside. And the definition of me for modern is, you know, furniture that can go anywhere, whether it's a skyscraper, a castle, or an old barn. And I'll add to that inside or outside. And that's all I'm trying to do. Young people are coming to me these days because they want to learn. I, I'm not worrying about bringing them to the office or not. And they're coming in. What do you think it is that you have the ability to teach them that's going to be compelling for them, given everything that's changing around us? I think the ability to reflect intelligently on the past 25 years of design and the business of design gives me a little bit of a help looking at the next 25 years. And we've made mistakes, we've done things right. And how do you balance that out to make more correct decisions than incorrect decisions going forward? I think people like that. The don't know your history or doomed to repeat it is, is I think, really powerful. How do you rationalize that with being such an optimistic Knicks fan? (laughs) <laughs> depends how far back you go in history. So if history <laughs> repeats itself, we'll apply the Fibonacci code to when it comes back again and we'll jump on it. It'll all be good. Amazing. I had to throw that <laughs> call back in there. <laughs> John, can Fair you enough. talk to us a little bit about just kind of wrapping our discussion about future work and hybrid work or metaverse work? Talk to us a bit about corporate culture and how or where corporate culture may have suffered a little bit these last two or three years and how designers can think about bringing back corporate culture, maybe through the lens of designing for virtual spaces. Yeah, I think corporate culture has taken a huge hit. And I think no one knows how bad it got hit yet. I think you're still riding off pre-pandemic visions of what the corporate culture was. But when you bring somebody into an organization that's never been to a company lunch or seen the CEO come in hungover or whatever it's going to be. <laughs> the, the old school stuff that we all kind of caught glimpses of. We're going to have to have some kind of virtual way to understand the vision of the, the entrepreneurs who started the business. But if you lose that energy, if you lose that passion for product or design or for industrial happenings, wherever it's going to be, 
then it's very hard to develop that corporate culture because it is these mid-sized companies, small companies in America are the biggest employers. Small companies are run by visionaries. How do the visionaries get their message out there? And how do you become part of it? And how do you get your talent assessed? How do you know if the corporate culture is actually working? It's not just about productivity. It's about mood. It's about passion. It's about dedication. I think that's very difficult to do totally separated. So they're going to have to design a world in which we can hang out a bit. And it's not all about how many widgets did you produce today? Can you produce mm-hmm. more widgets tomorrow? I think that's antiquated. The Jack Welch philosophy of management is also relatively antiquated. Mm-hmm. It's what's next. And they talk about quiet quitting and all these different things. They don't want to work 75 hours a week anymore. So how do you make the most of those 45, 50 hours if you can get them to do it? And what inspires them to do it? It's not sitting at home with your dog barking to go outside. You're losing Wi-Fi. That's not what creates an environment to go and do more than you've done before for your organization. And that has to be figured out. Yeah, seeing people's faces, I think, was a, a nice way that you put it the other day, John, that the way in which we interact right now is transactional and you see somebody's face when you're asking them to do something rather than seeing them in the hallway and having a quick collaborative discussion. They can put on a temporary face on the computer. But I'm telling you what, you walk through your own customer service department and you see their faces in the phone and you hear the tone they use. And it's very hard to replace, you know, design within reach. I tried to spend an hour a week on the phones and customer service with my people. And I could have done it just by listening in from my desk, but it wasn't the same. I wanted to see if they looked calm doing it, if they were natural, if that was their gift. And it wasn't easy to tell just from listening. And if they're not in the phone and they're in the in-between calls, are they crying? Are they going through a nervous breakdown? <laughs> you know, it will what, what's going on? And can the metaverse be broader than, we keep talking about, where you can see the whole company? It's going to have to be a place where you can walk down the hallways and see who's going to the bathroom or getting a drink of water from the founder, Fred refreshing a coffee, even if they're not with you. John McPhee and I at Design With Reach, we take our office to the kitchen for half a day a week and just see people getting coffee and hang out a bit and ask them a few questions. How do you get that back? It can be done, right? But we just have to figure out how. It's that social collaboration element that we're missing, exactly. which is exciting too, because that's when you think about the pillar of a metaverse versus just maybe virtual reality and not to take away from VR because it's super important. But one of the founding pillars of metaverse is social interaction. I think that's probably a very exciting opportunity for future of work once we can get it to the right level. No and even just broadly, future of design as well. How do you find a new way to replicate the CEO being able to sit down in the lunchroom mm. and watch people get coffee? This next generation, you're talking about new CEOs who find new ways to have those same sort of interactions. I mean, this is interesting because we've heard applications of the metaverse be used for onboarding and mm-hmm. employee training. And you have the CEO coming in to talk to the new employee, but of course it's scripted, loses a little bit of that off the cuff nature, which I think is important. But I mean, those are early iterations of that type of access that a CEO could have with the company. Sure. It's also one way, right? Once you say recorded, I'm like, oh, that's a great mm-hmm. onboarding, right? You will do this way every <laughs> single you know. time. You know, I just said to the desk with the intern, some people can't speak at all. They're so nervous. And some people can't stop talking. You know, well, where you're from and what college you're going to, what's your passion? Why mm-hmm. are you here? And then all the other people listen in. I and mean, there's something cool about that. And I don't think it's going to go away, but it's going to come from your generation where you don't know much different than the new technology kind of seeping in. I think all the Wall Street firms demanding everybody's back in the office. Oh, we're so successful. Everyone's back in the office. And you really ask them. And it's a group of people, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at best, working way fewer hours and honestly being less happy. It's just to satisfy a bunch of old dudes in the corporate C-suite saying, oh, we have to have the office back. It's just not going to be the same. I think what you guys are doing is the future. It, and it's part of evolution. And when we don't realize we're going into the metaverse and exiting the metaverse, when it happens without effort, that's when it takes off. I think we're close, but we have to figure out how to design it so it's seamless. The natural adoption of Microsoft Teams and Zoom over the pandemic is the perfect example of the rate of which we can naturally adopt something without even realizing we're doing it. The earlier example is the iPhone, when all of a sudden people realized they could do all those things from their pocket that they never could do before, right? That was a pretty fundamental shift that really came from one piece of technology. And it happened at a time when not everyone was ready for it. Everyone was just trying to figure out how to type a little faster on their BlackBerry keyboard 
I think we're in another one of those phases where even a product is going to leap so many things so far forward really quickly that it's exciting to be here for it. Let's bring this back to design from the perspective of a furniture manufacturer. How are we going to use great design to attract people to spaces in real life or IRL and also in the digital worlds? Test the design is probably going to have to take into account a virtual interaction. So you might be designing real world product to facilitate metaverse interaction. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting in an Aeron chair. But when I'm virtual and I'm walking, maybe the new version of the Aeron chair will simulate my walking. I always go back to the movie uh, Ready Player One. They had a place where you could go and become part of the metaverse. So maybe the furniture has to translate from material, where we're all sitting and working together, to at the flick of a switch into the metaverse and help us have that experience and make it seamless. Like maybe the furniture, rather than having a USB port, has to be much more sophisticated. Maybe the concept of the chair today is where I hate technology and furniture. Maybe we won't have a choice but to have really forward technology in the future. Yeah, or a different definition of ergonomic. Or it could be both. I think it's exciting too. You could have identifiable real world design that we find really beautiful. And then to your point, an evolved version of that tech. Exactly. Or your entire home office becomes one device the way that the Peloton stood for home fitness there for a while. If you're sitting with your associate, you say, oh, let's, let's have a meeting with Jimmy in Taiwan. How is that facilitated? You're going to have to design a couple of things. One is you're going to design a place to meet. You're going to design furniture in your own environment to facilitate you getting there so you're comfortable. And then you design an extension of the home office in the metaverse so that you're not changing everything, but you're extending versus leaving. I don't think people are going to leave their office. They're going to extend the office. It's like going to the new addition they built or the new, the new commissary. It's like going to a different room in mm-hmm. the building. It just happens to not really be in the building. I can understand why folks question whether a metaverse component to an office and designing for a metaverse is just something silly that we're talking about right now. But when you think about the tools we're using and the way in which we're trying to force functionality on those tools to replicate the experience you get in an office, I don't know if y'all did those Zoom happy hours early in the pandemic. Let's all get (laughs) on a Brady Bunch Zoom call and awkwardly drink a cocktail for 15 minutes or creating- Sometimes there was a a PowerPoint slide too, Bobby, that had some fun (laughs) games on it. Don't forget the PowerPoint slides. The Cats channel and Slack, which all serve a purpose, (laughs) but you're trying to stimulate this artificial chance moment. And obviously people want it. And the tools right now are inadequate. They're not designed for it. I love John's point on the extension of our world or extension of our physical space. It's almost like I can compare it to how I feel about my Facebook profile. I hate Facebook. And in a way, I'm not the entire brand itself, but let's just call it the digital identity part of it. I really just go on it to clear the notifications. And so it's a lost product for me. But why do I keep it? It's a digital identity. It's my extension of myself in this virtual space. And so Let's blow that up. That's exactly what you're talking about. You're going to hire Gensler to design your new office. And it's part of the new office is, oh, what's the meta office look like? It's going to be just part of the original design. You don't have to ask them to do it. It's part of the deal. Everybody's going to have to have it. And, oh, gee, I was in Gensler's conference in the other day. That's amazing. The meta or the real? I was in the meta. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, you should see the real one. I was in the real one. You should see the meta one. I think it's going to be an extension of the brand philosophy. I mean, having this discussion is making me think about how it's going to work out. I really do think that'll be it. It'll be much more of an extension than someplace different. It harkens back to the rule of Web3 when we're at mass adoption of Web3 is when you don't realize you're in a metaverse. It's a metaphor. We used to have that in the office where you just went to the office every day. For me, I got on a train. I walked down through Manhattan up to my office, took an elevator, sat down, and I didn't really think much of going to the office. It was just part of what was expected. And then we lost that expectation over the course of the pandemic. I was forwarded one email from a corporate communications team that was imploring its employees to quote unquote, pop in a few times a week. Like what kind of return to office (laughs) strategy is that? And so in order to really nail it here, you need to think about what's the way in which, at least through the lens of work, I'm 
transitioning into a metaverse. I'm transitioning out of a metaverse. I'm transitioning into the virtual Gensler conference room. Then I'm transitioning into the physical Gensler conference room. And all of this feels natural. It feels day to day. It doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel contrived. One thing we've talked to a number of folks about is this idea that these spaces can be used in concert with the physical space to be able to experience a showroom or a product or a type of an experience in a metaverse setting. How can you create something that's going to make people only feel like the real physical experience is even more exciting, even more desirable to go to? So there's the marketing and a brand engagement level when you think about it in that way as well. Sure. I mean, I've been out selling furniture. I'm carrying furniture up and down stairs and in the elevators, and it feels so 1940s. I would love to have an alternative. Um, we're just not there yet. We're still, on most cases, operating so far below our current technology level of what's available. We can't even board and deboard airplanes any differently than we did for 50 years ago. And now we're asking people to go to a virtual airplane into a virtual conference room somewhere. It's, these are huge jumps. We're leaping over and leaving a lot of unfinished technology behind us. And so some of that's going to tie together and, and, and I think create a more cohesive process. But what are we going to skip over? Because we're going to leave a lot of stuff unfinished. Or just a lot uh, of I stuff that we're just not going to get right. There's an interesting exercise there to say what should be left unfinished as well. I think there was a couple of votes for the Zoom call. Uh, in this discussion. <laughs> I'm sure that there's things that we're living with every day that we're not quite as happy with that we do have a, an interesting and exciting opportunity to start to skip over. Like I often use the comparison to there's a lot of nations in the world where they'll never have a desktop computer. They've gone right from having nothing to having a mobile phone with internet access, and they're not really going to have the experience in the middle. They'll never know the joys of a dot matrix printer or dial up internet in their home or any of those things that we experienced in the last 25 years, that's the way that a lot of this progress can happen. And it doesn't always need to happen in a developing country with the explosive growth that we have around tech right now. Yeah, no question. Can I jump back? I would love to get your take on this question, John. You talked about the boardroom of Gensler and the boardroom in the metaverse that Gensler has as well. And you're saying it's an extension of one of the other, not to be crass, but my background being in furniture sales you know, I immediately go, well, who sold them the metaverse furniture? Are we, are you giving that away for free? Is that an extension of the investment they're making in the physical space? What is, from your perspective, what does that look like? Is that a revenue stream? Is it an Yeah, it's a total revenue stream. So I think the same kind of physical distribution system will probably still stay in place. So Genser designs your office. They go to a Her and Miller, a Knoll, a Steelcase, all steel, whomever, to buy the furniture from. And like, oh, what's your solution for the metaverse? What's in the toolbox to use in our new virtual mm -hmm. conference as well as the regular conference? Like, oh, have you gotten the, uh, the freedom chair done for the meta? What's different about it? And how do they link to each other? So I think you're going to have two different kinds of designers. Interior designers don't make all the furniture, don't make all the things. They're still going to go to the vendors. We can keep the same kind of system going. It gives designers a chance to keep designing and, mm -hmm. and making cool stuff. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I could see it working that way and following the same sort of um, course or path. One of the things that we hear about when we talk to furniture manufacturers is that there's a value to physical goods because of the amount of time to produce, because of the luxury goods and materials and all the design hours. Do you think it would follow a similar pricing scheme? Do you think it's something different? I, I have to think it can't follow the same pricing scheme. It doesn't seem to make sense. Herm Lower spent with $17 million designing their last tax chair. And with the one before this last one, they created one of the great chairs of all time. Does it cost a hundred grand to design the best chair? If we're not talking about mm -hmm. comfort and it's purely visual, how do you judge the value of an artist? It's by what people like the most. No, I don't think it's going to follow the same pattern. Let's say you do your whole conference room in the Herm Miller furniture. There's probably an add-on at a small cost for the virtual version. If you're thinking of it as an extension and keeping the like same kind of corporate vibe in that next world, you would take an extension of what you designed in the physical world to the metaverse, I would think. Do you see Heller stepping into or responding to that market demand? I do. I wonder if you go for a walk outside in the metaverse, are you buying outdoor furniture or are you just floating? That's the big question. Are we going to float or sit or strap ourselves in or I don't know yet? Well, maybe I, not for outside, but I absolutely could see the value of a Studio 65 Kiss chair in a lobby. 
as part of an installation and something that I think would be really beautiful in both the physical world and digital world. So do I. I think it's a beautiful artistic piece. I get it. Yes, we'll be part of that. But the other piece, the more functional, highly functional pieces, I think don't have tons of value in the next virtual world. I think you're going to get a little more fantastical and just a little bit more free. What are the designs that become the iconic designs of a world that's not of the physical, right? The different designs will find different opportunities and there's actually a real scale opportunity there as well that might not exist in a physical world because of how many metaverse environments there'll be, because of how broad and vast that world could become. You might actually find that while the price points are lower, the volumes could become much higher, which is another interesting consideration point around these designs. Yeah, no longer do you have to worry about the, the cost of moving furniture from one world to the other. Or your supply chain is a room. click. Or your furniture could be programmed to evolve every 30 days into something different. Mm -hmm. I think it's democratic design too. You have the opportunity to educate and give access of good design to more people, which is exciting. Yes. That would be the means to enter the verse, to enter the world. What is the, what's the barrier to entry just to experience the metaverse? You also go back to the first movers will have obviously an advantage, but also the luxury brands or the brands with brand equity will have an advantage. Just as I want my Nike tracksuit on my Bitmoji. If I'm thinking about equipping my conference room, I'll probably look to the brands I've worked with historically for my chairs, as opposed to going to the metaverse default option, which might be much cheaper because I'm accustomed to working with them and I want that brand association. That's you. But then when you go to someone who hasn't worked with those brands before, mm -hmm. and they're starting from scratch and you have a young entrepreneur with one employee, but he builds a virtual office for a thousand and invites people to join, that might be a totally different vibe. And he's never heard of these brands. He may just work with whoever the next young designer is to go up and just bang it out. And was listening to an interview with Jan Winner. He has a new book out. And he was talking about how he started Rolling Stone. He just went up to people and said, hey, man, want to do an interview? And they said, yes. So it's before the world got so kind of barriered in. You could do whatever you wanted to do. And we're almost at that stage again, where you just can do what you want to do. You're not really tied so. into to what you know. That's a good point. So Andrew, Tess, and John, I know Dickby and Heller are partnering right now on a blockchain-based authentication token that you'll be launching soon. Can you tell us about what that looks like and why you're excited about the partnership? You know, the worst thing in the world is when people copy your furniture. And a lot of people today buy copies and don't even realize they're buying copies. So what if you can give them kind of a guaranteed stamp of authenticity and I use that term non-fungible. It's a very ugly sounding term, but it seems to fit. If you get a non-fungible guarantee that you have something that's authentic, you increase the longevity of that piece by decades because they'll keep being traded. The other half of that is with our product, if it starts to wear out, which is shipping for a very long time, you can take that non-fungible token, the guarantee of authenticity, send the piece back to us. We'll recycle it into a new piece and give you some ridiculous discount on the new piece. So I'll know that it's the right plastic, the right formulation that I can just grind up and make a new product. So not only will the piece be traded over time, but that information in the token will link back to the original company so they can get it recycled to do the right thing going forward. Otherwise, how would you ever track that? If I sell a set of four chairs to somebody and it goes to their children and then it sells to their cousin and then it's sold at a yard sale, It'd be nice to have a piece that goes along with it that lets people know how to dispose of it or how to keep it great or how to keep it valuable so they can sell it on eBay again with that stamp of authenticity. That sustainability angle, Tess, I'm sure is something that you're passionate about too. Definitely. I think it's really important when we think about true authentic design furniture, it's something that's meant to last a lifetime. And whether you're the first owner or the second owner or third or fourth, you really have the opportunity to pass that ownership and that authenticity on and make that process of deeming something authentic more efficient. I think the other thing that's really cool about it is it's a digital touch point for a manufacturer with an end consumer, which is something that isn't necessarily as common. 
So there's a real opportunity for an interaction to happen there, for a relationship to start to get built and for more information to be exchanged than simply just the details of the product and that authenticity and sustainability story. So a lot of exciting opportunities that come from that digital physical connection. John, what advice would you give or resources that you would share with a listener out there who's looking to get into the space or even just understand all of the metaverse and this new tech that we've talked about just a little bit better? Just try to do anything. Try to get a non-fungible token of your design. And it's not going to be easy. I mean, you guys are invented this company, Digby, which is a, a platform to do that. Just do something that's interactive. And then all of a sudden you're in it. You're probably already wearing an Apple Watch. You have a phone. You're doing Zooms and Google Meets. You try to take a small step in that new direction. I think that's a pretty cool way to start. Love that. Thank you that so much, awesome, John, John, for your time. Really. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, thanks, John. It was great having you on. Yeah, I love you guys. Thank you so much. So it's not every day you get to talk about the future of work with someone like John Edelman. And I think a topic that everybody has on their mind all the time right now in the new hybrid working environment we're all accustomed to. You know, we're recording this in mid-November and we're on the heels of massive layoffs at tech companies. And so I think we're all curious about how technologies, uh, you know, afforded by Web3, how platforms like various metaverses and and all of the different ways the future of work will be affected by um, the things we're going to be talking about throughout the season. And mm -hmm. John was a great person to really dig in on this topic with us. I mean, there aren't many topics where he's not a great person to dig in with. And I think we really saw that. Like from from my standpoint, I, I really just appreciate as a broad comment about John, the way that he really has a way to contextualize big concepts and and really bring them down to a level where you understand like, no, this is this is just like this other thing that we've seen before, or this is how this this trend moves, or, you know, this is a, a moment that's important to take advantage of. And I think, you know, we, what we heard there and what you hear from him on such a regular basis is, is just what the path is, how to keep things simple, how to, how to draw the straight line between, you know, what is the idea and what is the, the impetus for execution of it. Yeah, John grounds things and he has a way of saying something where you're like, after he says it, you're like, oh, no, duh. That makes mm -hmm. total sense. Um, and it's good to listen to him talk about Web3 when it's a, a topic that's hard to wrap your mind around. And he brings a lot of confidence and, and some outstanding perspective to it. Absolutely. And he's an advocate, too. He's a passionate advocate about the value of authentic design, which is something that's really core to everything that we strive for. And he loves to speak about the way that we can use this technology now to be an additional layer of defense in protecting the efforts of all of these designers and the value of authentically designed goods. Yeah, we've been so fortunate to be able, uh, as Digby, to work with Heller in doing that and having our Design Authenticator product launch with Heller at BDNY not too long ago. And so, you know, it, it's just exciting to have visionaries like that in the industry who can come down and really speak at a level that's so digestible and really takes all these concepts that we're talking about and brings them to life in a way that, you know, reduces barriers to entry. Like, I mean, I know you're the plug guy, Bobby, but I got to plug the Keep podcast name. Look at Andrew right there. Yeah, oh my exactly. goodness. Mm -hmm. Proud of you, man. Well, I'm working on it. I'm learning from the master over here. <laughs> <laughs> this is so motivational. Well, you know who else is motivational? Is Sam and Wise, and Hannah, <laughs> and the whole team at the studio by Sandow. If you did not know, Barriers to Entry is a part of the Surround Podcast Network, and you can go to surroundpodcasts.com. Don't forget that S. Uh, to listen to some other great podcasts. Bobby, do you have a podcast plug uh, for another great Surround podcast for the for the listeners? So in addition to slamming a follow for Barriers to Entry on yeah, your slam. favorite podcast platform, hit, hit go ahead button. and hit, hit the that follow button. button for Looking Forward from Miller Knoll, hosted by Ryan Anderson, VP of Research at Miller Knoll, one of our favorites and a proud partner of the Surround Podcast Network. And I think we also have a shared upcoming guest uh, with Ryan's podcast as well. We right? do, coming soon, coming in a few weeks, we'll be welcoming on a Web3 lead from the Miller Knoll family. So make sure you stick around for that. Mm. Gentlemen, as always, it was so much fun yeah. hanging out with you two. Absolute pleasure. Make sure to join us next time as we continue to break down the barriers to entry. Discover more with Surround, a podcast network from Standout Design Group.
featuring the architecture and design industry's go-to shows. Surround is the hub for creative conversations, endless inspiration, and design resources. Hear from tastemakers, researchers, designers, and architects themselves. Trending now on Surround is The Mic from NYC by Design, hosted by Debbie Melman. Learn more at surroundpodcasts.com. 